it used to be Private Eye and the Guardian's Pawford Awards. You've now consciously uncoupled, and it's just Private Eye. Any comment on that? Well, I mean, we've spent, you know, two years in very, very complex negotiations to get out of the deal with the Guardian. It's gone well. Uh, a lot of compromise on both sides. And uh, there's no deal. So it's just our awards. Page 94, the Private Eye podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of Page 94, the Private Eye podcast. My name is Andrew Hunter-Murray and tonight we bring you a live podcast brought to you from the Paulfoot Awards, the award ceremony with champions, investigative journalism. We're going to be hearing from all the people who've been nominated, we'll be hearing from the editor of the magazine, we'll be hearing from the chief judge. Uh, If you weren't here for episode one which was a a similar vibe but recorded with substantially worse quality microphones, then this is like a really souped-up sequel to that. Uh, So we'll go now and we'll talk to Podrick Reedy, who is the chief judge of the awards. Here he is. One of the things that we really looked at with the prize this year was people who stuck out a story that seemed unfashionable, possibly, or wasn't Westminster-based, and thought, is this something that... Paul would do and, and I think the, the ones that made the shortages were all ones that were n- not necessarily big stories of big names but they were stories that revealed something fundamentally true about our society. Well that's another thing about the shortlist is it's incredibly varied you've got architectural journals you've got fishing stories you've got broadsheets you've got uh, you've got the Daily Mail in there it's all from everywhere. Well of course I mean yeah if we even talk about Paul's legacy again I mean he wasn't someone who was particularly concerned with what was, you know, a right-wing paper or a left-wing paper or, you know, he, he was concerned with the stories and the journalism involved. So we took that on board and the, the, there was a huge amount of entries this year, um, which was very encouraging because having revived the awards, I think, I think the eye were a little uncertain as to how many people would actually turn up this time. But it was a record amount of entries and the quality across the board was was just astonishing. Uh, A lot of people are very keen to sound the death knell of investigative journalism because it's expensive, it's often unsexy, it often doesn't yield results. There are lots of things where you investigate for months and then it collapses. Any pessimism from you? Certainly not having taken part in this year's prize. I I, I understand, as much as anyone else, the the pressures of of time particularly, I think, on on, uh, journalists, um, not just money. I think if people really want to do something, they'll just do it. But time can be a massive pressure when you have to have your website updated five times a day to say to your editor, you know, I'm buggering off for two weeks on something that might not come to anything, actually, but we'll see. Right. I think William Hill is still taking bets. Any final clues before we go in? I'm afraid it will be absolutely indecent to say so. Uh, that was Padre Greedy. Now, here's the Eyes editor, Ian Hislop, talking about who Paul Foote was, what he did, and why we're here celebrating his work today. Paul Foote was a great campaigning and investigative journalist who worked on Private Eye. He was almost the greatest single influence on the Eye in terms of investigation. He was brought in in the early uh, 60s because he'd been part of that Shrewsbury gang. He was at school with Richard Ingrams and Willie Rushton, unlike them, had become a rabid socialist and decided that his mission in life was to run stories about the real world. And Richard Ingrams, my predecessor, got Paul in to tell him what was going on in the world. He left in the 70s, he went off to work for the Mirror, and when I became editor, my first job was basically to re-employ Paul. And I just shamed him into coming back to work for us. He was a campaigner, a journalist, but also his main skill was making technical investigations interesting, fun and accessible. And one of the first pieces he wrote was about a tower block collapsing. 1968, Ronan Point, you wouldn't believe the contemporary resonance. This block collapsed. They were very lucky there were only a few deaths. But if it had collapsed, you know, five hours later, everyone in it would have died. And it was preventable totally. It was not a, you know, an act of nature. They essentially built this thing to designs that a lot of people knew were unsafe. And here we are again. We ran a piece on a tower block called Lackanall House, in which I just looked at it today. I mean, this was 2009. It said the main problems are people were told to stay put in the fire and there was only one stairwell. And I think, oh, right. So in the subsequent eight years, we've learned almost nothing at all. Uh, Sprinkler systems, you know, one of our journalists, Jane, uh, has repeatedly written about uh, people trying to get out of putting sprinkler systems in, even into new schools. This stuff 
you just have to say it again and again. And Paul's great quote was, it's no good winning the argument once. You have to win it in every generation. You have to win it every couple of years. And we need to win it again. So that's the judges, that's the editor. Now let's hear from the people who've actually written the stories on this year's shortlist. I'm Will Hurst, managing editor of the Architects Journal. Um, I brought my dad along, uh, Jeremy, who's a long-time Private Eye reader. I think he started reading Private Eye in the early 60s or something, so (laughs) he's quite excited to be here. That's that's pretty much issue one of the Eye, early 60s, so that's great. That's very (laughs) exciting. So can you tell us a little bit about the the story that brought you to the Paul Fodder Walls tonight? The story is the investigation of the Garden Bridge, which began about two and a half years ago when I had a hunch that there was something funny about this project and the cast of people who were involved in it. So I started asking questions about the uh, apparent competition that the Mayor of London, at the time Boris Johnson, and Transport for London had held. My suspicion was that this wasn't a real competition, and the more I dug, the more that seemed to be the case. So how how did you go about it? What were your methods? I started putting in freedom of information requests to both the GLA and Transport for London. Uh, One of the things I got back in the early days of the investigation was the scoring of the three architects who'd been involved in the competition, including the winning architect, Heatherwick Studio. And I immediately realised that this scoring was very unusual because uh, Heatherwick was scoring higher than the other two architects for things you wouldn't expect him to be scoring higher on. For example, bridge experience, where he'd only designed one bridge before, whereas the other two had designed dozens of bridges, <laughs> including award-winning bridges. So it just didn't make much sense. The other thing I got that was very interesting was correspondence between Boris and Joanna Lumley, where she was lobbying him to back this project in a sort of handwritten note, which was very funny because it was written in kind of ab-fab language talking about, oh, thank you so much for the tulips, Boris, and oh, I'm, uh, we were cheering from the rooftops when you won your election victory. <laughs> so this was kind of gold dust. So now it looks like the Garden Bridge may not happen. I mean, this would be a massive result, and also probably the f- physically heaviest result to emerge from the awards tonight. Well, thank you, yeah. Um, massive result, but perhaps not great in some ways because it will cost the taxpayer $50 million or something, even if it's cancelled. <laughs> so, Are you accepting any liability for that $50 million tonight? Well, I, I maintain that the cost would have been considerably higher had they ploughed on with it. I think Sadiq Khan has now got to grapple with that and make sure this sort of scandal never happens again. What large architectural project are you going to cause to be cancelled next? <laughs> Well, I mean, obviously, we're, we're very busy investigating this awful fire at Grenfell Tower. And it remains to be seen, you know, what role architecture has played in that. But as you can imagine, the architectural community are very, very worried about it and very shocked, as is everyone else. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's the focus of, of investigation at the moment. Fantastic. Congratulations again, Will. So I'm Maeve McLennigan, and I worked on a project for Energy Desk. I'm Krina Boros and I work for the project for Energy Desk. Maeve, Krina, first of all, it might be good to just hear about Energy Desk and what it is, because it's a smaller outfit, you know, and uh, I think people won't be as familiar with it. Sure, so Energy Desk is actually the news platform of Greenpeace UK, and they have done something quite innovative, which was to bring in a load of journalists and investigative journalists. Uh, Because basically they saw that there was a gap in the market. There are lots of people doing investigations. There were some great people doing environmental stories. But nobody was really doing investigations about environmental stories. So they brought in um, a load of really talented uh, journalists to kind of dig in to the stories that nobody else was looking at. So, in a nutshell, can you tell us about the story that's, uh, that's got you nominated tonight? Yes, we looked into pretty much who owns the fishing rights in the UK. And we follow the money and shareholder ownership. And we've had some very interesting findings. One of them being that three companies alone owned two-thirds of the fishing rights in England and Wales. Is that people being given quotas and then selling them on and these companies slowly accruing them over time? We were looking at which company owns each boat and which company owns the company that owns the company that owns the boat. So one of the things we found was this tiny little boat called the Nina May, which was a 4.8 metre fibreglass dinghy 
And because of this weird system that we have that allows people to kind of barter quota, to trade quota and store it up, this one boat had enough quota that it should technically have been fishing four tons of fish a day. (laughs) Obviously, that's not happening. And we managed to find where this boat was, track it down to the marina, talk to the people that owned it. And they said, no, obviously, that's not how it works. But we're playing the rules of this strange game that means that we can protect them by putting them on this tiny dinghy which means that we can kind of fish with impunity and never have any kind of prosecution or punishment for any fishing infractions. We were looking for, you know, I mean, any kind of port. We, we looked through absolutely every single God-given fishing, tracking database on the planet, and Nina May was nowhere to be found, and eventually found a picture of Nina May from 2009 on an obscure forum, and we actually were able to see how tiny this boat is. And it was extraordinary then to go back to Peter Carter and challenge him on the way he's doing his business, the owner of Nina May, that is. And also we've looked at the uh, nationality of the ownerships as well. For example, in southeast of England, all the fishing rights went to the Spanish, whilst in Cornwall, pretty much all of them went to the Dutch. So what's the consequence of those rights being owned by A, a few companies, and B, a few foreign-owned companies for the British fishing industry? Fishing and and fish are meant to be a kind of public resource that are open to anyone. And we used to have a really thriving fishing industry here in the UK. But what we found is that, so there's quotas that come from the EU. And in, you know, some people's minds, Nigel Farage is never people's. They are seen as the problem, that the the quota that the UK is getting is a problem. Actually, what our investigation found was it's the way that the UK divvies up that quota. So we spoke to fishermen across the country who said that they were basically being priced out of the market because they didn't have access to this quota. They couldn't go out. They were having to go and lease this quota at sometimes extortionate prices, meaning that their profit margins were tiny. And that basically meant the degradation of a lot of fishing communities uh, across the UK. So this is our fault, not Brussels, is the nutshell. So there was that day when the flotilla kind of floated down the Thames, hosted by Nigel Farage. Uh, On that same day, Jeremy Corbyn actually stood up in PMQs and quoted our figures and said, the problem is not the EU, or it's not only the EU, but it's actually the distribution and the monopolisation and commodification of this quota system here in the UK that has allowed just three companies to become the absolute kind of fish quota barons of the UK. And also what Greenpeace tried to do with this investigation, and even before that, was to convince DEFRA to give a heavier weight to economic and social principles in the way the fishing rights are allocated throughout the country. They even took DEFRA to court and they lost. So there's, yes, it's us, it's our government. So I've also just started a podcast called The Tip Off, which listeners might be interested in, which goes behind the scenes of some of the best investigative journalists in the UK, tells the story of how they did it, all of the twists and turns and the dead ends and the frustrations. I, I, I don't think there's any market for investigative journalism podcasts. I think it's, I think it's stitched up. <laughs> that, that's the tip off. Do, do give it a listen. I'm Daniel Ballant Curti from Global Witness. I'm Lee Baldwin from Global Witness. So, this is a story about uh, two businessmen, Phil Edmonds, who was a very famous English cricketer, and his uh, partner, uh, Andrew Groves. How they listed several companies on London's junior stock market, the alternative investment market, and set about to obtain assets. And also, they intimidated uh, businessmen that they fell out with using private security agents. Do you mind if I ask how you came by this in the first place? Because it, it sounds it sounds niche. We started with a cache of leaked documents, and it went from there. Yeah, and that was really the beginning of it. We we ended up getting several caches of leaked documents, and. Uh, And then started digging. We we spoke to dozens of sources in the UK, um, in Liberia, in South Africa. And then we spent a lot of time going through court records and uh, corporate documents and just following the trail until we managed to pin down exactly what they were doing. When we put it to them, they didn't have much wiggle room. Uh, Now, they both deny all of this, of course, but uh, what did they say when you put it to them? They came up with some very convoluted answers about the money flow and where the money was going. And they said that they were for their benefit of family trusts and all those sorts of things. But in the end, their explanations rather helped to confirm our assumptions. (laughs) They thought the family trust was a loophole. They thought that excused them and and they could get away with it. But we're saying the deals may still have fallen foul of the law. And now there's a big trial in, um, in Liberia, and senior political figures in Liberia are, are now up in the dock. 
And this is the, the snowball that's resulted all from your story. What happened in Liberia really, really surprised us. People came out on the streets. There was a political upheaval. The chairman of the ruling party and the speaker of the Senate were arrested. There was an exorcism at some point. And well, you have to tell us more about the exorcism. I think they, had, they, had an, they held an exorcism in the Senate House of the Liberian Parliament to um, rid the building of the evil spirits where alleged corruption had taken place. Are you guys possibly the evil spirits that they would have really been keen to get rid of? I very much like to think so. My name is Billy Kember and I'm a journalist at The Times. Billy, hello. Can you tell us uh, in a nutshell what your story is about, please? Yes, yeah, so a series of stories about a group of drug companies which hit upon a ruse whereby they could buy up the rights to old drugs, drop the brand name and thereby rack up the price to uh, ludicrously high levels, so thousands of a percent at a time. How? How do they do that even? You just wait for a, a passant to drop and then swoop in? What they discovered was there was a loophole in the way the NHS prices drugs or the way the NHS pays for drugs, which meant that drugs sold under a brand name are subject to a strict uh, profit cap. There's not much scope to increase the price. But if you drop the brand name and release it as a generic, then there is no control on the price other than competition. And if there's no competition, you can do what you want. This will ring very strange to a lot of people who frequently save money by dropping a brand name and getting a generic thing. But this is just a quirk of the NHS laws, is it? It, well, it played on exactly that, which is that generics are meant to save money, and they normally do save money. But in the case of these medicines, where there was a specific effort to use the loophole and increase the prices, it had the opposite effect. And it, it was costing, by last year, uh, the NHS an extra £370 million a year just in the increased cost of these very old drugs that was not justified by new research or new manufacturing methods. It was pure profiteering. How did you come across it in the first place? I came across it in a slightly roundabout route in that I was initially looking at something called pay for delay, which is a phenomenon in the US where a big new drug invention, the manufacturer is running out of time on its patent, it doesn't want rivals to come in and produce a competing generic and so pays them off. I looked into that, I didn't find much evidence of it happening uh, at the moment in the UK, there were some old cases, but what I did start to notice in, in the um, data I was looking through was a, a pattern of drugs going up in price after moving between categories in something called the NHS drug tariff. And who's, uh, who's behind this? That's a very simplistic way of phrasing the question, but there we go. Who's behind it? Well, there's a group of about four core companies that have done it. Three of them are family-owned to begin with. Some of them have been sold on to private equity since. And they all live in roughly the same neck of the woods and seem to have, many of them seem to have known one another and, and just essentially hit on this ruse and then the news spread and others jumped on. And uh, it's only now, belatedly, that it's um, being cracked down on. Well, I was about to ask, what, what happened next? What happened Because it was on the front page of the Times for, for weeks, you know, where did it go? Well, unusually, it's had quite a, a rapid result in that the government said, ah, we, this shouldn't be happening, and drafted this new legislation to stop it happening, and has now passed that legislation. It passed just before the election, and we're waiting for them to use it once, um, you know, Theresa May manages to form a, form a strong and stable government. <laughs> Uh, but what that will allow them to do is to step in and say these prices are unreasonable, we're going to immediately impose a lower price. The other thing that's happening is the competition authorities in the UK and in Europe are investigating, have already handed out some fines and are investigating other companies for abusing a uh, dominant position in the market is the uh, name of the offence. I hesitate to say it, this sounds dangerously like a result for investigative journalism. I would say it is dangerously like a result. I'm Emma Yule, I'm an investigations journalist for Archon and I'm here for a campaign that was nominated for the Hackney Gazette, which is one of the titles I write for. So can you tell us a little bit about the campaign? What was the thrust of it? Yeah, the campaign was essentially um, looking at case studies of people that were living in homeless hostels in Hackney. The story first landed on our desk when somebody had called in about a dead body that had been found in a homeless hostel in Hackney. It was a very hot summer's day and um, the body had apparently lain there for three days and not been found. The residents of the hostel were just completely freaked out about this and somebody had had the guts to pick up the phone and call us about it and that was really where it all started from. So I went down and did some initial reporting on conditions in this hostel, what we could find out about the death but it became really clear afterwards that this was a much wider problem than one hostel and one set of people living there so um, I used freedom of information requests to dig up information about how much it was costing the council to keep people in hostels, the number of people living in hostels in Hackney, which we found was the highest um, of all London boroughs, 
and then I just went and interviewed a whole load of other people living in hostels to try and get an idea. Um, what we found was it wasn't the sort of expected homelessness cases, maybe, you know, problems with drink or drugs, alcohol, mental health problems. There were lots of particularly young mums, young families living in hostel rooms who just couldn't afford to rent a private property in Hackney. And that was really where the whole thrust of the campaign came from. Uh, I think it was called the, the Hidden Homeless, wasn't it? Because these are people who might have fallen behind on their rent, then they've gone to the council, and then all that's available is, is a hostel for them. Absolutely right. The reason we chose the name The Hidden Homeless was because I think the fact that these people are living in hostel rooms in their thousands in Hackney is really not known about more widely. Uh, you know, when people are rough sleeping, people see them on the street. Uh, that's a more visible problem. But there are actually thousands more people living in temporary accommodation, sometimes for up to two years at a time. And I, I just felt that there wasn't a, a, as wide a perception of, of that problem. Is, is there a reason that it's especially bad in Hackney? What I would say about that is I, I'm not sure it's especially bad in Hackney, but I think the borough has a policy of not moving its homeless people out of borough. And so the reason that the numbers in hostels in Hackney are very high is because they make every effort to actually try and keep people in borough if they can. So I don't think they have a, a particularly worse problem um, with people not being able to afford housing than any other London borough. But some of the policy decisions that they've made have resulted in the fact that people are living in hostels in, in Hackney Moor. The other thing that's really stark when you look at the figures, the council simply can't afford anymore to place people in private rented accommodation either. So sometimes private the owned hostels are the only accommodation that the councils are able to place people in within the cost uh, limits that are set by the government on benefits caps. Is there somewhere that the story is going to go next? The campaign is still running in Hackney. Um, we continue to take calls from people about housing probably you know, every week. I'm actually working at the moment to try and broaden the campaign across some of our other London titles. So I work for 10 weekly newspapers in London. Um, we're, we're at the stage where we're just trying to see whether we can pick this story up across other London boroughs. And another strand that we're also looking at is um, when people are moved out of borough, where are they actually placed? So we're, we're doing some work at the moment to try and dig a bit deeper into that. Th that's very interesting that you work for 10 newspapers. <laughs> I mean, Paul Foote worked for a few newspapers in his time, but that's quite something. And this, this is part of the, the whole Archant Investigations Unit. It's sort of an umbrella thing, is it? So I work, I'm the London Investigations Unit um, journalist. So we, we have 10 weekly titles in London and I, I report across all of those. The Archant Investigations Unit is three people. Uh, we have an investigations editor who's based in Norwich, which is where our, our daily titles are, and another investigations journalist who's based in Suffolk, who works for our titles up there. So we're quite a small team, but we, we try to make the best of it. <laughs> I mean, it's a job I'd always wanted to do, and one I, I probably never would have imagined I would be able to do, working in regional press. I began my career as a reporter with the Hornsey Journal, and then moved on to be news editor of the Ham and High and Archant took the decision two years ago to set up an investigations unit and at that stage I applied for a secondment to go and work um, in that and that's how it started really and I think it was one of those jobs when it came up I just couldn't not go for it so thankfully it worked out quite well. <laughs> My name is Daniel Taylor and I'm uh, the Chief Football Writer for the Guardian Observer. Daniel, can you tell us a little bit about the story? Well, it was last November. In, well, in actual fact, I was, I was introduced to Andy Woodward who was the first footballer who who spoke out publicly about, um, about the abuse that he'd suffered when he was a young footballer. He became a professional footballer. He waived his anonymity and he told me at the time he thought that there'd be hundreds more would come forward. And to be honest, I, I do remember in the build-up to the story, we, we, you know, we really took our time sort of before we went to print with it, speaking to him and saying to him, do you really want that quote in that there'll be hundreds of us? And him saying yes, he was absolutely convinced. And then um, according to the last figures, which, which were in April, so they're, they're almost outdated now, these figures, there, there were 560 footballers have come forward in, in that time and there's 232 suspects named. But as I say, they, these are two months out of date, so... You know, God knows what the true figure is, and, and also I would I would also add the number of footballers who who haven't come forward to the police because one one thing I found a lot, a lot of the footballers have been um, you know they, they now have the kids of their own or or their parents are very elderly and perhaps widowed and you know it's an incredible strain you'd be putting on your own family to come forward so so I know I know probably as many who haven't come forward as who actually have. And what happens next? What have been the results of the story in terms of you know, proceedings, investigations that have been opened? Well, I have to be slightly careful here because there are quite a lot of live proceedings going on. But um, we, we have a number of people who were very successful back in the day, um, coaches, scouts, 
who, who are facing substantial charges with a huge backlog of other people coming forward. It's actually across Europe now. People, other footballers across Europe are coming forward, which in, in turn has had the same sort of snowballing effect. So Holland, for example, has been a big, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of a lot of these stories coming out in Holland with the players that started this. They've been contacted by players from Brazil, Germany. So it has really gone global, as, as it were. Um, we have already had, I wouldn't really say it's a football conviction, but we have already had convictions for child abuse where people have been in court and they've said the reason they came forward was because they felt empowered by what they saw from these footballers and they and so we had one recently with the which related to the boys brigade in Plymouth where one of the victims said in court that he that he felt strong enough to come forward because he'd seen some of the footballers talking about it and he realized you know it's time now to come forward and not keep it as a secret well uh, congratulations are you going to keep running with this story or are you moving on to a new investigation no no I'm absolutely keeping with it um, we all know now that there's the enormous number of victims but but there's also the what I would describe as the sort of scandal side of the story about who knew you know what they did about it what could have been done about it who perhaps turned a blind eye so I I do think there's an awful long way for this story to go yet now one of the shortlistees in tonight's awards uh, sadly can't be here tonight but I thought uh, we ought to tell you about her anyway she's called Catherine Faulkner of the Daily Mail and her investigation was how Royal Mail helps con men defraud the elderly it was an undercover investigation and it identified the industrial scale postal fraud being carried out against the elderly in Britain. Uh, it revealed a trade in the contact details of vulnerable old people who were then targeted via fraudulent mail shots, which the Royal Mail were routinely delivering in bulk under their mass mail contracts, which earned them a lot of money. For the campaign, Catherine went undercover at a data conference for scammers. She interviewed victims of this fraud, and she spent nearly a year tracing back the frauds to overseas post boxes. The results were that Royal Mail subsequently announced move to ban the distribution of letters that it suspected of being part of scamming schemes. Another campaign tonight which has yielded proper, tangible results uh, that no one else had thought to tackle. Uh, congratulations to Catherine and to all the other shortlistees. We now go across to Ian Hislop on stage announcing the winner of tonight's Paul Foot Award. Um, the system we used in this was that the winner was the person who got the most votes. Quite a controversial one <laughs> at the moment. Um, sorry, but that's how we chose to do it. So... The winner of the Paul Foot Award 2017. I don't think it could be better, more relevant, more topical, or more suitable. It is Emma Yule. Hello. <laughs> um, thank you so much. I'm absolutely stunned, gobsmacked, quite speechless. Um, it is such an honour to win an award with Paul Foot's name on it. And amongst this incredible competition here tonight. Um, Thank you so much. My biggest thanks really have to go to the people who are living in homeless hostels in Hackney who allowed me to interview them and to come in and see their lives. It was really brave. Many of them were quite scared about doing it and without them there would have been no reporting. I think it's really important to say that after the events of the last week, the fact that a safe, secure, stable, affordable home should be a right and not a privilege and that is still not the case in so many Situations, and I think that's something that people still really need to think about. Um, some thank yous as well. I'd like to thank um, editors Ramsey Al Wakil for the Hackney Gazette, my investigations editor Tom Bristow. Thank you also to Archant for investing in investigative journalism. We're a new team at Archant, two years old now, so I think it's really important that they've done that, and long may it continue. I know this isn't actually the BAFTAs, but I just wanted to say a couple of personal thank yous. <laughs> Um, Firstly, to my mum and dad. My dad will kill me if I don't say this. (laughs) Um, But more seriously, because they always taught me that um, if you put your mind to something, you can always achieve it. And that's the way I've always worked. Thank you so much. Again, it's an incredible privilege and honour, and I'm just so delighted. Thank you. (laughs) 
So that's it for this week's podcast. Congratulations to Emma Yule and to all the other shortlistees for magnificent bits of investigative journalism. If you want to find out any more about any of them, you can do it on the Eyes website uh, or by buying one of the old copies of the mag, although that would be an eccentric thing to do. If you want to read more investigative journalism, uh, it comes fortnightly in private eye shape wrapping. And if you want to listen to another one of these, we'll be doing another one in a fortnight. It was produced by Matt Hill, and we will see you again before too long. Goodbye. <laughs>